12th episode in a new series of podcasts about the Apostles of Jesus Christ and the Urantia book. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Make sure you join the Temple Mount Discord server, find our podcasts on YouTube and BitChute. That being said, welcome, Tios. How are you, my friend? Doing good, Shogun. Thanks for having me. It's great to finally <clears throat> get to doing this. I know you and I have been talking about it for a long time. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So I think you said you wanted to do like two apostles at a time, correct? Yeah, I think that um, it would be a fun and digestible way to read this particular chapter. And I think that it would get people a little bit more interested if they weren't already in the apostles as men and maybe look forward to hearing more about the other apostles. It would be good. Sounds awesome. So which apostles are we going to talk about today? Today, we are going to go over Andrew and uh, Simon. Simon Peter. Uh, I'm going to begin with a, just a short intro uh, to the chapter here. So it begins, paper 139, the 12 apostles. It is an eloquent testimony to the charm and the righteousness of Jesus' earth life that although he repeatedly dashed to pieces the hopes of his apostles and tore to shreds their every ambition for personal exaltation, only one deserted him. The apostles learned from Jesus about the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus learned much from them about the kingdom of man. Human nature, as it lives on earth and on other evolutionary worlds, time and space, these 12 men represented many different types of human temperament, and they had not been all made alike by schooling. Many of these Galilean fishermen carried heavy strains of Gentile blood as a result of the forcible conversion of the Gentile population of Galilee 100 years previously. And do not make mistake of regarding the apostles as being altogether ignorant and unlearned. All of them, except for the Alphaeus twins, were graduates of the synagogue schools, having been thoroughly trained in the Hebrew scriptures and in much of the current knowledge of that day. Seven were graduates of the Capernaum synagogue schools, and there were no better Jewish schools in all of Galilee. When your records refer to the messengers of the kingdom as being ignorant and unlearned, it is intended to convey the idea that they were laymen, unlearned in the lore of the rabbis, and untrained in the methods of rabbinical interpretation. They were lacking in so-called higher education, in modern times, they would have certainly been considered uneducated, and in some circles of society, even uncultured. One thing is certain, they had not all been put through the same rigid and stereotyped educational curriculum. From adolescence on, they enjoyed separate experiences of learning how to live. And um, I just want to stop right there and kind of acknowledge some something about that, which is <clears throat> that... that to the teller of this particular verse and chapter here, it's very important that we understand that the men were different representations of humanity. That each man, almost as if uh, uh, a literal representative of that type of person or man on earth. So we're going to begin with Andrew, the first chosen. Andrew, chairman of the apostolic courts of the kingdom, was born in Capernaum. He was the oldest child in a family of five. Himself, his brother Simon, and three sisters. His father, now dead, had been a partner of Zebedee in the fish-drying business at Bethsaida, the fishing harbor of Capernaum. When he became an apostle, Andrew was unmarried, but made his home with his married brother, Simon Peter. Both were fishermen, and partners of James and John, sons of Zebedee. In AD 26, the year that he was chosen as an apostle, Andrew was 33, a full year older than Jesus, and the oldest of all the apostles. He sprang from an excellent line of ancestors and was the ablest man of the twelve, accepting oratory. He was the peer of his associates in almost every imaginable ability. Jesus never gave Andrew a nickname, a fraternal designation, 
But even as the apostles soon began to call Jesus master, so they had also designated Andrew by a term equivalent of chief. Andrew was a good organizer, but a better administrator. He was one of the inner circle of four apostles. But his appointment by Jesus as the head of the apostolic group made it necessary for him to remain on duty with his brethren while the other three enjoyed very close communion with the master. To the very end, Andrew remained dean of the Apostolic Corps. And although Andrew was never an effective preacher, he was an efficient personal worker, being the pioneer missionary of the kingdom in that. As the first chosen apostle, he immediately brought to Jesus his brother Simon, who subsequently became one of the greatest preachers of the kingdom. Andrew was the chief supporter of Jesus' policy of utilizing the program of personal work as a means of training the twelve as messengers of the kingdom. And whether Jesus privately taught the apostles or preached to the multitude, Andrew was usually conversant with what was going on. He was an understanding executive and an efficient administrator. He rendered a prompt decision on every matter brought to his notice unless he deemed the problem one beyond the domain of his authority, in which event he would take it straight to Jesus. Andrew and Peter were unlike in character and temperament, but it must be recorded everlastingly to their credit that they got along together splendidly. Andrew was never jealous of Peter's oratorical ability, and not often Will an older man of Andrew's type be observed exerting such a profound influence over a younger and talented brother? Andrew and Peter never seemed to be in the least jealous of each other's abilities or achievements. And late on the evening of the day of Pentecost, when largely through the energetic and inspiring preaching of Peter, 2,000 souls were added to the kingdom, Andrew said to his brother, I could not do that. But I am glad I have a brother who could. To which Peter replied, And but for you bringing me to the master, and by your steadfastness keeping me with him, I should not have been here to do this. Andrew and Peter were the exceptions to the rule, proving that even brothers can live together peaceably and working together effectively. After Pentecost, Peter was famous. But it never irritated the older Andrew to spend the rest of his life being introduced as Simon Peter's brother. Of all the apostles, Andrew was the best judge of men. He knew that trouble was brewing in the heart of Judas Iscariot, even when none of the others suspected that anything was wrong with their treasurer. But he told none of them his fears. Andrew's great service to the kingdom was advising Peter, James, and John concerning the choice of the first missionaries who were sent out to proclaim the gospel, and also in counseling these early leaders about the organization of the administrative affairs in the kingdom. Andrew had a great gift for discovering the hidden resources and latent talents of young people. Very soon after Jesus' ascension on high, Andrew began the writing of a personal record many of the sayings and doings of his departed master. After Andrew's death, other copies of his private record were made and circulated freely among the early Christians of the Christian church. These informal notes of Andrew's were subsequently edited, amended, altered, and added to until they made up a fairly consecutive narrative of the master's life on earth. The last of these few altered and amended copies was destroyed by fire in Alexandria about 100 years after the original was written by the first chosen of the Twelve Apostles. Andrew was a man of clear insight, logical thought, and firm decision, whose great strength of character consisted in his superb stability. His temperamental handicap was his lack of enthusiasm. He many times failed to encourage his associates by judicious, by judicious commendation, and thus reticence to praise the worthy accomplishments of his friends throughout of his abhorrence of flattery. 
Andrew was one of those all-around, even-tempered, self-made, and successful men of modest affairs. Every one of the apostles loved Jesus, but it remains true that each of the twelve was drawn to him because some trait of personality which made a special appeal to the individual apostle. Andrew admired Jesus because of his consistent sincerity, his unaffected dignity. When men once knew Jesus, they were possessed with the urge to share him with their friends. They really wanted all the world to know him. When the later persecutions finally scattered the apostles from Jerusalem, Andrew, Andrew journeyed through Armenia, Asia Minor, and Macedonia, and after bringing thousands into the kingdom, was finally apprehended and crucified in Petraea in Icaia. It was two full days before this robust man expired on the cross. And throughout these tragic hours, he continued effectively to proclaim the glad tidings of salvation of the kingdom of heaven. As Andrew. And I'll stop there for a moment to allow anybody that might have some comments or questions about what we just read to give you a chance to talk about Andrew before we move on to his brother, son, Peter. I have so, one question about Andrew before, sorry, before anyone else jumps in. Uh, am I correct that Andrew is famous for being crucified on an X-shaped cross as opposed to the usual T-shaped cross that Jesus is depicted on? Is that Andrew? I do believe you're correct, yes, sir. It doesn't mention it here in the chapter, but I do believe that's accurate. So this is the Urantia you're reading from. Yeah, this is the Urantia you're reading from, right? Yeah. So, what, like, who wrote who wrote the Urantia is what I'm wondering. Uh, like, uh, how old is this? Book is... 70 plus years old to 80 plus years old. Um, the um, origin of the book is something that you can kind of look into on your own because it is kind of a long subject. And so I'll let you do that there. Uh, in okay. short, this would be considered channeled. Oh, right? I see. So it, it's sort of like uh, almost like a sort of Christian version of a lot of the sort of new age kind of texts where they're they're like, they're like they're like communing with uh, higher dimensional beings. Is, am I getting that right? The story is told that a doctor was approached by a wife whose husband was talking in his sleep, and these are the words of that man who was talking in his sleep. Uh, the subject whose identity was never released. But I'll let you guys, each individual person, can kind of look into the authenticity, the origin of the book on their own time and their own way. If you're interested. Uh, I personally just kind of absorb something's information. If it's good, it satisfies me. It fills that part of my life up. I can understand and see that it's good, right? I, it makes perfect sense to me when I'm reading it. And then when you align it with everything else you know about Christianity, about the apostles, about Christ, uh, it's typically almost always uh, some kind of universally accepted idea, idea where you might not find this here in the Bible, but you will find it in the writings over here of letters, right, from Paul to, you know, some of his students. You'll find it in other places. It's always somewhere. Uh, that's where the information is coming from in the Urantia book. And I'll okay. just mention also that uh, we did a really good podcast about the Urantia book with Teos in the past. I'll post it in the chat later when I have a minute, um, but I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested. Um, so we go into a lot more details about the Urantia book than we'll get into today. But... Uh, Good questions. Does anyone else have a question or comment before we move on? I have uh, one thing I thought we probably should have established for someone who might not know is like what exactly is an apostle, right? Before like uh, what defines an apostle? I mean, it's a basic question. Probably should have asked at the beginning, but uh, in somebody this particular up their religion for something else. In the, in this Pardon particular. Uh, in this particular context, an apostle is one of 12 people chosen to be uh, part of the, the leadership in uh, Jesus' church here on earth. Right. 
Awesome. Um, should we carry on to Simon Peter? Sure. Okay. Simon Peter. When Simon joined the apostles, he was 30 years of age. He was married and had three children and lived at Bethsaida near Capernaum. His brother Andrew and his wife's mother lived with him. Both Peter and Andrew were fisher partners of the sons of Zebedee. The master had known Simon for some time before Andrew presented him as the second of the apostles. When Jesus gave Simon the name Peter, he did it with a smile. It was to be sort of a nickname. Simon was well known to all of his friends as an erratic and impulsive fellow. True, later on, Jesus did attach a new and significant import to this lightly bestowed nickname. Simon Peter was a man of impulse, an optimist. He had grown up permitting himself freely to indulge strong feelings. He was constantly getting into difficulties because he persisted in speaking without thinking. This sort of thoughtlessness also made incessant trouble for all of his friends and associates and was the cause of his receiving many mild rebukes from his master. The only reason Peter did not get into more trouble because of his thoughtless speaking was that he very early learned to talk over many of his plans and schemes with his brother Andrew before he ventured to make public proposals. Peter was a fluent speaker, eloquent and dramatic. He was also a natural and inspirational leader of men, a quick thinker, but not a deep reasoner. He asked many questions more than all of the other apostles put together. And while the majority of these questions were good and relevant, many of them were thoughtless and foolish. Peter did not have a deep mind, but he knew his mind fairly well. He was therefore a man of quick decision and sudden action. While others talked in their astonishment at seeing Jesus on the beach, Peter jumped in and swam ashore to meet the master. The one trait which Peter most admired in Jesus was his supernal tenderness. Peter never grew weary of contemplating Jesus' forbearance. He never forgot the lesson about forgiving the wrongdoer. Not only seven times, but seventy times seven. He thought much about these impressions of the Master's forgiving character during those dark and dismal days immediately following his thoughtless and unintended denial of Jesus in the high priest's courtyard. Simon Peter was distressingly vacillated. He would suddenly swing from one extreme to the other. First, he refused to let Jesus wash his feet, and then, on hearing the master's reply, begged to be washed all over. But after all, Jesus knew that Peter's faults were of the head, if not of the heart. He was one of the most inexplicable combinations of courage and cowardice that ever lived on earth. His great strength of character was loyalty and friendship. Peter really and truly loved Jesus. Yet despite this towering strength of devotion, he was so unstable and inconstant that he permitted a servant girl tease him into denying his Lord and Master. Peter could withstand persecution and any other form of direct assault, but he withered and shrank before ridicule. He was a brave soldier facing a frontal attack, but he was a fear-cringing coward when surprised with an assault from the rear. Peter was the first of Jesus' apostles to come forward to defend the work of Philip among the Samaritans, and Paul among the Gentiles. Yet later on, at Antioch, he reversed himself when confronted by the ridicule of Judaizers, temporarily withdrawing from the Gentiles, only to be brought down upon his head with fearless denunciation of Paul. He was the first one of the apostles to make a wholehearted confession of Jesus, combined humanity and divinity, first, save Judas to deny him. Peter was not so much of a dreamer, but he disliked 
to descend from the clouds of ecstasy and enthusiasm of dramatic indulgence to the plain and matter-of-fact world of reality. Following Jesus, literally and figuratively, he was either leading the procession or else trailing behind, following afar off. But he was the outstanding preacher of the twelve. He did more than any other one man, aside from Paul, to establish the kingdom and send its messengers to the four corners of the earth in one generation. After his rash denials of the master, he found himself. And with Andrew's sympathetic and understanding guidance, he again led the way back to the fish nets while the apostles tarried to find out what was to happen after the crucifixion. When he was fully assured that Jesus had forgiven him and knew he had been received back into the master's fold, the fires of the kingdom burned so brightly. <clears throat> Sorry, that one hits me right there. Give me a second. The fires of the kingdom burned so brightly within his soul that he became a great and saving light to thousands who sat in darkness. After leaving Jerusalem, and before Paul became the leading spirit among the Gentile Christian churches, Peter traveled extensively, visiting all the churches from Babylon to Corinth. He even visited and ministered to many of the churches which had been raised up by Paul. And although Peter and Paul differed much in temperament and education, even in theology, they worked together harmoniously for the upbuilding of the churches during their later years. Something of Peter's style and teaching is shown in the sermons partially recorded by Luke and in the Gospel of Mark. His vigorous style was better shown in his letter known as the first apostle of Peter. At least this was true before it was subsequently altered by a disciple of Paul. But, people, but, Peter, but Peter persisted in making the mistake of trying to convince the Jews that Jesus was, after all, really and truly the Jewish Messiah. Right up to the day of his death, Simon Peter continued to suffer confusion in his mind between the concepts of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah Christ is the world's redeemer, and the Son of Man is the revelation of God, the loving Father of all mankind. Peter's wife was a very able woman. For years, she labored accept acceptably as a member of the woman's corpse. And when Peter was driven out of Jerusalem, she accompanied him upon all his journeys to the churches, as well as on all his missionary excursions. And the day... Her illustrious husband yielded up his life. She was thrown to the wild beasts in the arena at Rome. And so this man, Peter, an intimate of Jesus, was one of the inner circle, went forth from Jerusalem, proclaiming the glad tidings of the kingdom with power and glory, until the fullness of his ministry had been accomplished. And he regarded himself as a recipient of high honors, when his captors informed him that he must die as master had died on the cross, and thus was Simon Peter crucified in Rome. <clears throat> so that's Simon Peter. Andrew and Simon Peter, the first two of Jesus' apostles. And, um, uh, I think that after going over that probably a dozen times in my life, it never stops punching me in the gut. The level of detail that goes into the description of their characters. And it's just always beautiful to me. And it just makes me shudder sometimes. Like uh, makes me just get shivers all over my whole body when I'm reading it and really can see them in my mind. I'm happy to be able to share that with you guys tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. It is a very detailed and vivid description of the characters that we don't hear in the Bible, that kind of uh, detail about their personalities. It's really interesting to think about where the Urantia book gets this information. And 
but yeah, it's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I had one question. I don't know if you know the answer. Do you know how many of Jesus' apostles end up being crucified in the end? Um, yeah, I, I do believe that it does answer that question. Uh, as we get to the end of the series here, and I, and I want to say that uh, all of the apostles except for one or two were crucified. Wow. That's something you don't often think about that all of, you know most of Jesus' apostles actually met the same kind of death that he did, or in some cases, you know, actually suffered on the cross longer, much longer than he did, right? You said that Andrew was on the cross for two days. I think Jesus was only on the cross for a few hours. So that's interesting to think about. Yeah, and in the Urantia book, it goes into a deeper story about Simon Peter, where it describes that he is crucified upside down in the middle of the Colosseum of Rome, and his wife is fed to the beasts in front of them, and he is preaching to her the whole time, screaming and crying and preaching to her. And, uh, yeah, so... The fate that many of them felt was was terrible, and that's why I think sometimes Shogun, we talked about this a few weeks ago, was that when we're we're uh, exposing someone who's seeking Christ, and we and we think that oh, you know, God's working in their lives, sometimes we begin to uh, be afraid for them. I do personally because it's you're you're now you're now open to the warfare. Now that comes into your life. If the followers of Christ have been persecuted in every way, shape, and form, you better understand that it's going to happen to you as well as soon as you begin to truly follow him. And that's uh, something that I think all Christians should understand. Like, the more your faith grows, the more that the battle begins. I totally agree. And Jesus says many things to that effect, you know, uh, just like me, you will be persecuted and led into prison and die by the sword. Just remember that the world hates you because it hated me first. So it's powerful, dude. And uh, I think, you know, I'm glad we're doing this series because the apostles really are not fully manifested in most people's minds as like living, breathing characters. They're just kind of peripheral to Jesus. But there's obviously a huge significance to each of them, and uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about all of that. That's awesome. I hope it, it does function as kind of a teaser that gets uh, you guys interested in the episodes to come. So that's awesome. For sure. Um, should we open it up for questions? Yeah, absolutely. Does anybody have any questions or comments, having heard the presentation? Uh. Yeah, I think, um, uh, never mind. It's not important. So just to reiterate, um, Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross, and Peter was crucified on an upside-down cross, I guess, which is why the upside-down cross is sometimes called the Cross of St. Peter. And I, I'm not sure, but I think they're the only two who were crucified on non-conventional crosses like that. Um, so I wonder if there's some significance to that. One of the apostles, I do believe, was, was crucified on a pole. Okay. You had a question, Tigris? Yeah, so they say, uh, you know, I studied religion in school, and they say, historically, they can trace back an eclipse that occurred the day Jesus was possibly crucified. It happened um, when I think Bethlehem was under Roman rule. There was an eclipse that happened. Can you... Do you know anything about that? No, I've never heard that said before, but that's neat. Well, I believe the Bible even talks about it. It's like the skies went dark and like there was like, I don't know, it's almost like a Pompeii kind of thing. Yeah, the veil was torn, the skies went dark, the, the temple was reduced to ruins. And that would be, Wait. I think, the first temple, right? No, it would be the second temple, I believe. The first temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar or something like that, the Babylonians. And the second temple was destroyed by Nero. Right? So was was Judas, was Judas one of the apostles? He was the one who sold out Jesus, right? 
Yeah, Judas Iscariot was the one who betrayed Jesus, as he's described. What's the difference yes. between Simon the Zealot and Simon the other side? There were two Simons, right? Yeah, you know what? Uh, if you guys uh, have questions about the other apostles, we're going to have to wait until uh, next uh, next episode. And we're going to get into them. And that uh, should be exciting. Today was just kind of about Andrew and Simon Peter. Um, but each apostle, Tigers, to answer your question, some of them, except for Andrew, uh, had uh, nicknames, fraternal, fraternal nicknames that was given to them. Fascinating stuff. Uh, anyone else want to ask a question? Last chance. All right, well, Tios, I want to thank you very much for sharing this information with us. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Looking forward to the future episodes. Thank you for your time. And yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody who listened and for your questions and participation. And I will be uh, sending the recording for uploading to YouTube and BitChute. So make sure you find the episode there, as well as our other hundreds of great episodes. Join the Temple Mount Discord server so you can catch the next episode. Live. Thanks, everybody. God bless.